Chris Abraham Show. to the Chris Abraham show. My name is Chris Abraham and I am going to do my best talking about super controversial things on a Sunday late morning. Ons Uhr or Elf Elf Onse Anyway, this is going to be about code switching. This is going to be about white supremacy and the definition of white supremacy. This is going to be about hegemonic Western culture default. This is going to be about um, cultural assimilation or uh, anti-assimilation. Um, this is going to talk about the cost of, of assimilation and the cost of anti-assimilation. Sorry, assimilation. This is going to talk about my dad and how even though he was just a guy from North Jersey, he actually bought a bunch of books and gave himself um, elocution lessons so as to avoid the active classism associated, associated with sounding ignorant, associated with sounding like an ignorant, low-caste, low-class, poor New Jersey Cretan. My dad wanted to move to Manhattan, become an artist, and so he spent months working on trying to uh, decontextualize his growing up, which was very modest. His dad was a factory worker. His mom was a stay-at-home mom. They lived in New they lived in northern New Jersey, and he had a Jersey accent. He and my mom had a Jersey accent even when we lived in Hawaii, but it was basically only the word water, which is how I say it. I say, I can't even say water. I say water, and I can't help it. That's how I get, that's how I get outed. So, this is, um, it's 11 o'clock a.m. on uh, the 2nd of July. I am at Penrose Square Park. I am watching little kitties play in the upward fountain. You know, like those kind of fountains that come up of off of slate stone from the from the ground, and it is actually encouraged. It's completely legal, and little kids are playing. And I'm trying not to look like a creepy guy, but this is my park too. I'm here twelve. I'm here twelve seasons, so. I mean, four seasons, I'm here 12 months a year. Okay, let's get into it. It is, ep it is season five, episode 22, or would it be 22, or would it be, um, what is after Elf? Dizun, uh... Zwei, zwei und elf. Zwei und... I don't remember. doesn't matter. I don't even care to find out. Um, all right. So I've been listening to a lot of people talking a lot about white supremacy associated with the Supreme Court decision to ban, to consider... Uh, To consider, oh, I even forget the term, ugh. The affirmative action case in college and missing, the admission, the ruling there. And, um, you know, I, I do not have any skin in the game when it comes to, uh, when it comes to that, to... Um, the affirmative action case, I believe that 
any university can bring in anybody they want. If they want to have 13% or a representational percent of their university um, of their university population to be African American, I think that that's their decision. I don't care if it's merit-based, I don't care if they break the rules, I don't care if they lower the bar. Um, I do care about whether or not those kids uh, have the tools to graduate, and I wish pre-K through 12 was better across the board. Um, I reckoned my parents didn't have enough money to get me a tutor for algebra, or I would have asked for one. I didn't know that there were ways of getting them. I just assumed that it was a, a legitimate test of how smart you were. I didn't know that I had all kinds of weird brain stuff, like the inability to cheat by having visions in my head of uh, geo, uh, 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 geometry theorems and algebraic uh, formulae. But that's neither here nor there. This episode is about assimilation. And it's about code switching. And it's about code switching as defined as one is a master of the master's culture, but also a master of one's own culture. Now, Code Switching is the name of a show and a podcast that NPR produces. And the reason why they talk about code switching is because everybody who listens to NPR, produces NPR, is fluent in what's called, you know, uh, white, or, you know, what's considered uh, Western cultural hegemonic Midwestern English, American English. And, but they're also possibly uh, also fluent in their particular dialect or their local dialect or their cultural use of language or their immig- their 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 immigrant language their spanish persian pashto whatever arabic um and then some people are trilingual with regards to knowing uh english their own cultural patois english pigeon and also their their family language right but if you don't know those things you're not code switching so if you're if you're monolingual and you've decided that your monolingual nature is not standard american english proper english proper english like i would even get rid of water because that's still regional dialect that's still improper I guess you could start getting rid of T's like Clinton and Connecticut and you can add vocal fry because if you just, all you need to do is emulate whatever rich, powerful uh, city dwellers, however academics speak. So if you do vocal fry and you go Clinton and you go Manhattan and you go um, which is Massachusetts. It's fine, right? Um, English, England has its Queen's English and then has regional dialects. A lot of those regional dialects are considered to sound ignorant or low class. Um, There are, you know, New Yorkers. Outside of New Yorkers in Manhattan, like, you could have a PhD and there seems to be some sort of pride with speaking Manhattanite, which to outsiders sounds pretty ignorant. So my dad probably sounded pretty ignorant when he was a young man in the Marines. And maybe people at Paris Island made fun of him for his New Jersey accent. But for whatever reason, when he died, I found a bunch of his books and they were for elocution lessons to try to um, make my dad, who was half Czech and half Hungarian, into a more sophisticated, agency-appropriate, BBDNO, um, um, you know, illustrator and artist for graphic designer in Manhattan. So that's what he did. And 
I think that's smart. I think that it's smart in the same way that when I moved to Hawaii, I'm a chameleon, right? So I desperately try to appease and appeal to make other people comfortable. I do not stand any ground. I would prefer to have a good time with the person I'm with, the beautiful child of God that I'm with, than assert my dominance over them. Whether or not they think that I'm a simp or a wimp or a cuck or a duck or a fuck or a whatever, gluck, gluck. Um, so what I did, the first thing I did when I got to Hawaii is my mom and I agreed that in the house I would speak proper English, which, you know, is the filling of an Oreo and a Twinkie and the fruity flesh of the banana, right? Because in Hawaii, just like in D.C., if you are a local boy or a, an African-American guy or like a Latino guy who's trying to be cool in school, if you talk like a nerd, you're you're described as being a Twinkie. Not a Twink, but a Twinkie, which is yellow on the outside and white on the inside, right? Or if you're an African-American, you're an Oreo or whatever that other yummy dessert is with black on the outside and with the white creamy filling. Um, and of course, you know, banana in Hawaii as well. Yellow on the outside, which is to say Asian and white on the inside. So if you assimilate, become really good at school, get extremely high SATs, join the speech and debate club, become a math, math word, or a math nerd, uh, join the, the band, um, play Dungeons and Dragons, uh, I guess, um, become a mathlete, join the chess club, um, and get into, uh, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Berkeley, Princeton, Brown, Dartmouth, then you are, uh, yellow on the outside, white in the inside. You are white supremacist. That's why people use the term white supremacist, because that is the most defiling ways possible to get across the idea of banana, Oreo, or Twinkie. It basically means that you are selling out your culture to the culture of your master, which is the white man. And it can be very dangerous. I feel like everybody, uh, the only thing in the entire world that um, Angela, Merkel, Angela Merkel from Germany and I agree on is that everybody should try their darndest to assimilate with the culture they buy into, or they're born into, or they move to. Otherwise, uh, they are doing. They still might succeed, but they might only succeed within the confines of their subculture, right? So, around here, there's pupu pupusa restaurants, right? You don't actually ever have to learn any English in your entire life if you cater to other Salvadorans or other Peruvians in my neighborhood, right? Or if you, um, I don't know, I guess, you know, uh, extend that stereotype a thousand times. Like, I guess if you have a, um, you know, if you have the right targeted restaurant or the right targeted uh, beauty parlor or the right targeted this, right targeted that, you can thrive within the definition of your subculture. But if you decide to enter into a greater culture, you would better be fluent in every culture. You would better be able to do what, um, uh, what black comedians are always able to do, which is make fun of white people. You know, um, Eddie Murphy does this beautifully. He can switch it on and all of a sudden become an Urkel, right? Become a complete nerdy white guy along with the uh, uh, immobility of the body, the kind of high-pitched uh, nasal voice, the adenoidal kind of thing, the lack of swag, the lack of cool, etc. But this was something that Angela Merkel did when I moved to Germany in 2008 and applied to get my residency permit which is everybody, including me from America, had to go to a very subsidized uh, language and cultural program. And a lot of that was a bait and switch way of trying to separate Turkish women from their, from their husbands. 
and give those women an opportunity to understand what their rights are in Germany as opposed to what they assume their rights are under their quote-unquote oppressive uh, Muslim regime of oppression where women are chattel or whatever people who are not Muslim think of Muslim families. So, when someone in D.C. says acts instead of ask, that is perfectly acceptable in a certain sub-community in D.C. It's a, it's a D.C. native way of speaking. Uh, you even say Washington and Warsh. Um, a lot of people say acts. It's a completely normalized thing, but if you go into the Midwest or if you are in a podcast or if you are interviewed uh, on uh, MSNBC or maybe CNN or whatever, and you say X, everybody's going to talk about it. It, became, it becomes a huge point of controversy and judgment. And so my dad realized that. My dad realized that he was actively being judged based on his North Jersey regional dialect and got rid of it. Now, I don't know why everybody is playing so much attention on finding select highly successful within the dominant Western hegemonic culture, finding those people who are people of color and then calling them white supremacists as a result of their um, uh, affiliation or assimilation or um, whatever you want to call it, they're thriving within the norms of that, uh, of that Western hegemonic tradition. But I don't think it is, I don't think it's positive. I think that, I think that even though, even if you get into a university as someone who only speaks one language, which is their regional dialect or patois, and is unable to communicate using the default, like, medium common dom or even the lowest common denominator of an Ivy League university. I mean, when I moved to Hawaii, because all we ever said was pupu, which is Hawaiian for hors d'oeuvre platter, I thought, because I was an avid reader, I came out to my buddy Mark as someone who said hors d'oeuvres and not hors d'oeuvre or hors d'oeuvre. And so as a result, Mark knew that I was a Hawaiian hick. I knew he was a Pennsylvania hick for whatever reason. And I think that the more... You might think that your regional dialect makes you more interesting. But, um, you know, that uh, that's just about as true as, you know, as someone from the South saying, you know, bless your heart. They don't really mean bless your heart 90% of the time. They mean, uh, got to keep my eye on you or you're an asshole or fuck you or you don't know anything or you're stupid or whatnot. So I really think that this defamation, this is not going to change 80% of the United States from speaking in English that is as good as possible in their, in their, uh, in their situation. But it's not going to make spelling bees less appealing to people. It's not going to change PSAT or SAT. It's not going to change spelling classes. It's not going to change gen grammar classes. It's not going to change the fact that um, you will probably have to be, uh, you probably have to spend half your college career in remediation classes if they don't, you know, request that you do remediation before you start, you know, you might end up with a five-year degree because they have to spend the entire freshman year um, remediating you on, on math and literature and reading, even reading and, and grammar and uh, critical thinking and all kinds of stuff, right? It's not about your innate horsepower. It's about how cultivated you are and cultured it are to put that horsepower down into the road. And here's what's even worse. There is a huge, I mean, just within anybody, if a poor person goes to GW or um, 
or Harvard, Yale, you know, whatever, there's a high incidence that your culture shock is going to be so dire that you, that you flame out. And um, I don't think there's any commitment amongst the top universities to, you know, to encourage you to get your degree. I think that all they need is the number of, um, I think all they need to do is fulfill their DEI uh, number. And then, you know, um, uh, you had your chance, you know, now uh, sink or swim. Or, if you will, someone said on, on a podcast, uh, they will transition away from STEM or whatever, and they'll end up with, quote, less competitive degrees. Um, which might end up just being social justice degrees, right? Like, I think that's fine. Um, I think everybody should, I mean, I studied American literature and I spent my last credit hours studying, uh, postmodern feminism and African American literary theory. Like I was rocking Derrida and Foucault. I was rocking, um, Ellen Sixu. I was rocking, um, um, uh, Leroy, Leroy Jones. Is it, um. Amiri Baraka. I was rocking Baraka. I was rocka Baraka. I was rockin' a Barakina way before any y'all you was even born. So I think it's really important to be at least bilingual. I grew up in, like I was saying before, my mom and I agreed that outside of the home, I was encouraged to speak fluent pidgin English, including all the pidgin English, all the Hawaiian words, all the Filipino words, all the Tongan words all the Japanese, Chinese, and Filipino words, but in the house and went around my mom and dad, I would have to speak fluent uh, East Coast English. Uh, it was a requirement. In the same way that lots of smart immigrant families now uh, make sure that their children speak Arabic or Pashtun or Spanish or Vietnamese or Filipino or whatever at home. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, if you don't have any tools and maybe if I could, if I could only speak pidgin English, I would be tracked to a, um, to a, uh, an appropriate job. I would be day laborer. I maybe if I'm lucky be mail deliverer. Maybe, you know, I'd be cashier, maybe. I mean, I'd have to speak to people. Probably, you know, um, factory worker or um, uh, mail room or I don't know. And if you consider uh, the, you know, default lingua franca of the American intellectual as being white supremacy which is to say the white filling in the Twinkie, uh, the delicious flesh of the banana, or the, uh, or the um, filling of the, um, of the Oreo, then you are going to put yourself in much peril and you're going to um, beat yourself up even before your struggle with life even begins. People will judge you. People will dismiss you. People will assume you're ignorant no matter how smart you really are. People will make fun of your written language. People will make fun of your posts. People will mock your emails. People will laugh behind your back at your uh, regional patois, unless it's extremely charming. You know, if you're not someone who, you know, has a really charming Louisiana sort of French um, uh, accent, you know, and he just sound like a Southern yokel. I mean, Southern yokels are even critiqued. Um, Goombas are, are critiqued. Everybody's critiqued based on their difference from announcer English or in England, the Queen's English, or, you know, in uh, France, there's a standards, or I assume that the Canadians roll the same way. And... Um, and that's just the way it is. I think that this empowerment is a bait and switch. I think this, this empowerment and the dismissal of anything that is 
traditional Western cultural references, Western cultural ideology, Western cultural norms, I believe it's a trap to put you into a place where you put yourself into a place where people, where you have an inability to actually perform in the real world where you are not just getting by because of your diversity, you're getting by based on how well you fit in. And you can legislate against it, you can make HR care about it, but um, being rejected by a community is a death by a thousand paper cuts. It's death by a thousand slices, and I don't think you should fall for it. I think you should practice your grammar. I don't think is your own lingua franca. I think you should keep your own regional dialect, but I think that when you are around people at a cocktail party or at an office party or during an interview, you should do as good of a job translating your ideas into a reflection of the person you're talking to as possible and in a bona fide way that is identifiable to other people that you have 140, 130, 120 point IQ and that you're not rocking an 80. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I assume that if you're listening to me, you're at least at the doorstep of being a genius. And I must tell you that I'm not a genius, but some of my best friends are. And they condescend to me. They make fun of me behind my back. They mock me outright. They judge me accordingly. And they basically keep me around for amusement purposes only. What I could have done to fix that is I could have gotten a master's degree instead of just a GW undergrad. I could have gotten a PhD, I could have gotten a law degree or a medical degree, I could have um, uh, joined the corporate world, I could have become a president CEO, I could have become of a larger company, I could be rich, I could be influential, I could be um, a jet setter, etc. Like there's all different types of, of flex one can do in order to define one's place in the world in relationship to the caste and class of other people. And the more you can do to seamlessly put on, you know, put on a, an understandable face. Like, for example, even Gen Z should be able to speak, you know, boomer. Um, there's no need for a boomer to ever speak Gen Z. But when Gen Z and Gen X have to understand what you're on about with all your riz this and like whatever that, when in a job interview you need to code switch away from your crazy hipster teenage, tween age, early 20s kind of speak, uh, because while it's a flex in school that you have better riz speak than your colleague. In, uh, in, a, in an interview environment, it just seems uppity. And that's another thing. Like, saying the word uppity is a really dangerous word. You can't call anybody uppity. But honestly, like, I had a colleague by the name of Diane. You could see her eye roll at 100 meters. Like, calling someone uppity has nothing to do with race or gender or whatever. Like, honestly... I don't know why my best friend Mark Harrison from central Pennsylvania isn't dead because he is uppity with cops. He's uppity with, with everybody. The guy should have been shot, punched, kicked. He just assumes because he's 150 pound, 5 foot 10, 40 regular, really like blue eyed, pockmarked face, completely white ginger redhead that um, he's both non-threatening and everybody assumes his, he, either he or his dad have a lot of money or could get lawyers. So they just assume that even though he's really disrespectful and uppity and mean to cops pulling him over, like literally rude, not even in a charming, endearing way, but like literally uppity, like people respond to that. And it took me forever because I was a merit-based guy. I think that if I do good work, 
you should hire me and be happy about it. But the truth is, is that I need to spend half my time managing up, managing clients, making sure clients like me, making sure clients continue liking me. And that's mostly what I spend every Monday doing, uh, checking every single connection I have to make sure people are pleased with the situation. And my only feedback loop for that is I'm doing a lot of work on Upwork, and it's based on a five-star system. So if my clients aren't happy, it could really destroy my reputation uh, on the service I use to, you know, for my bread and butter. So... Anyway, I don't know. I'll probably get canceled for this, but my goal is never give up your never give up your language of birth. If your language of birth was um, DC Pigeon English Patois or Hawaiian Pigeon English or um, Salvadorian Espanol or uh, North African French and Arabic or um, you know or uh, Hindi or whatever, do not let that go. Do not let that go. You know, you've got to go ahead and you've got to embrace it, but you also need to speak. You also need to speak in a way that disarms, impresses, and, uh, and charms, uh, the people you interact with who have more power over you and can pay you money and make your future in life successful, happy, and thriving. Um, it all comes down to meet anybody you meet more than halfway and never bite the hand that feeds you. So I love you guys. Please don't cancel me or please cancel me. Uh, please subscribe. Give me 12 stars. Give me a hundred stars. Like and reminder and the bell and all that other fun stuff. This is episode this is season five, episode 22. Love you. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.